We're going to dive into the um, border dispute, but I think it's really important that we start this with a pretty solid timeline, understanding historically what has happened in Texas down there at the southern border, particularly during the Biden administration, as well as Abbott. So we're going to go through some of the facts here, and then we're going to hit the law that really describes what states are allowed to do to protect themselves and what the federal government may do in response to that or also to protect themselves. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Supreme Court um, opinion, sending the Texas case back, back to the Fifth Circuit, as well as what might might come out of that opinion. Hopefully by the end of this, you will have a really solid understanding of what's going down at the Texas border. A lot of people in the media are really saying civil war, they're um, saber rattling, you've got pundits on both sides offering a whole bunch of spin and not really a lot of clarity regarding the facts and law of what's going down at the border. But I'm going to try to break it down for you. So hopefully you can be a bit more informed with some more practical knowledge about how this should play out. So let's go to about two months after um, Biden's inauguration. Uh, Governor Abbott announced that the Texas Department of Public Safety would begin a crackdown on the smuggling of people and drugs into his state. This was more of like a, a warning. We are going to take some additional actions. And he started calling it Operation Lone Star. This is the name of his main initiative, Operation Lone Star. It's fitting, coming from the Lone Star State. He wants to protect it. And what he said in his statement announcing Operation Lone Star is, this crisis at our southern border continues to escalate because of the Biden administration policies that refuse to secure the border and invite illegal immigration. And then... Um, he identified that the number of monthly encounters at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, climbed from 72,000 to 101,000. He would later claim that over 6 million immigrants crossed uh, the border into the United States during the Biden administration. It seemed like Abbott was frustrated that Biden reversed some of the Trump policies. And given that Trump no longer was in office... Um, it seemed like Abbott wanted to do something to protect his state because he didn't believe that Biden was going to be able to do that as a result of his immediate reversal of several Trump policies. So then we get to July 2022. Um, reports indicate that the Justice, Justice Department is investigating uh, the operation for alleged civil rights violations. Um, there was a, a statement uh, reported in the Texas Tri Tribune that DPS officials said that the DOJ was seeking to review whether Operation Lone Star violated <laughs> Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bars discrimination. So Greg Abbott creates this operation, and immediately Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice start investigating it to see if it has been involved in civil rights violations because of the supposed capture and deportation of, of certain individuals, as if that is some sort of um, discrimination. So then we get to March 2023, and Abbott de de defends deploying 60 miles of razor wire along the border. And this is where we really get our first significant effort. There were some things that were going on in the interior, but the border is really something that is controlled by the federal government. It's something that um, federal agencies have it in their responsibilities and duties to watch, and it is not typically something that states would get involved with. I cross the um, Michigan-Canada border quite frequently, and never once have I seen uh, state police at that border or National Guard trying to protect it. It's always very well protected by Canadian and Americans. Problem with Mexico is we've got a very large border. It's a land border. A lot of people seeking to cross it, and obviously we have some of that uh, cartel um, activity. So a new story from the El Paso Times noted that the deployment of razor wire along 60 miles of border was um, placed there in order to block immigrants from entering the state. And um, the federal government alleged very quickly that that was not uh, permitted by their border policy. So now you've got the federal government actively pushing back on the deployment of some security measures along the border by the states. It, fair enough, right? We'll get into the law soon, but this is not something the states would be involved in. Obviously, we understand where Greg Abbott is coming from. He's essentially saying, feds aren't doing it. I'm going to do it myself. 
The hard part is he doesn't have authority to engage in that conduct. Um, but there's an open question as to whether or not he has authority to place barbed wire. So I guess what I mean is his mission cannot be to protect the border and to deport people. But is he allowed to place razor wire or barbed wire anywhere he wants to in the state, I suppose he may have that authority. And I think he's probably talking with his lawyers to work within that authority. So Abbott declared a state of emergency in dozens of border counties because of the increase in um, in migrants. And then um, that was March. And then in June, um, Mexico sends a diplomatic memo to the United States objecting to Abbott's efforts. So we have Mexico specifically getting offended um, by this. So they made a diplomatic outreach, which is a specific way that one country may communicate with another about a specific problem. They made that to the United States and they said, we don't like the razor wire and um, we don't like Abbott's announcement. And we don't like the fact that he's trying to shut down portions of the Rio Grande. And the Mexican government specifically said, the Mexican government requested the United States that The buoys mentioned, just like the razor wire fencing, should be removed from the channel of the Rio Grande due to obstruction and deviation of runoffs towards Mexican territory. That was in their um, in their news release. So so Mexico objected in June. Then we get to July. Texas state trooper alleges that he'd been ordered in June to push migrants back into the river. That was an allegation. It was a July 3rd email to a supervisor. I'm not sure how this was discovered, uh, but he described what he called inhumane orders he'd been given um, the prior month. And that was reported. He said upon encountering 120 migrants on June 25th, including young children and mothers nursing babies in Maverick County, a rural Texas border county, he and another trooper were ordered to push um, people back into the water to go to Mexico. In one instance, he said a four-year-old girl attempting to cross through the razor wire was pressed back by Texas National Guard soldiers in accordance with orders that the child um, later fainted from the heat. So uh, this happens, and that is a that is a significant event because we actually have Texas National Guard at the border um, engaging in activities to prevent people from coming into the United States and to block their progress. The question for the Department of Justice in analyzing that is: Are these people offered protection from the law because they are in the United States, or are they still outside of the United States? And therefore, we wouldn't consider this a violation of the law that the Department of Justice could engage in. Now, the, the where the victim is located isn't necessary for um, criminal activity. I could commit cybercrime on somebody in Singapore and be prosecuted for that. But when it comes to violating somebody's civil rights, the question is, are they entitled to the civil rights? That's really important. Do they get the protections of the civil rights? We saw a lot of this with the drone killings um, of uh, certain um, terrorist organizations. And that's something that we we really studied quite a bit to ensure that we would have the ability to uh, target those people if they were United States citizens on foreign territory. I personally um, objected to some of the, the, the drone stuff that I saw in the news while we were targeting people not specifically in combat, because it might be um, a potential violation of the law of armed conflict, but that's a whole nother podcast for a whole nother day. Um, But the real question is, are we entitled or are people entitled to civil rights um, while they're not inside of the United States? Or would you consider these people inside of the United States um, and and they should receive the protection of, of civil rights? Uh, July 24th, moving forward, the Justice Department sues Texas over the buoys. So the federal government files a lawsuit um, citing, among other things, humanitarian concerns. I imagine this came as a result of the investigation that was previously announced. And um, they said the state didn't have permission to install buoys in the Rio Grande. And a few days before the suit was announced, um, there was some documentation that uh, that previous incident happened um, and it was reported that people were being pushed back. And so that was certainly included in part of it. It sounded like the DOJ was waiting for some information to suggest that they'd taken action against specific migrants. And when that happened, they were able to move forward with their lawsuit. So the federal government suing a state over border protection 
And it's really important to point the location of the buoy here. Um, it's in the, the river near Eagle Pass, Texas. This is where all the stuff that you've heard about recently is occurring, Eagle Pass, Texas. Um, this is a border city. It's on the Border Patrol uh, Del Rio sector where there's been a tremendous influx in encounters with migrants. It's actually more than tripled um, from 2021 to 2022. Um just a massive increase of the number of migrants coming over, which is exactly why Greg Abbott is um, deploying his efforts over there and suggesting that the federal government hasn't been doing enough. He's seeing a massive increase there, and he's trying to put his troops in a place where they can do the most good according to what he believes um, for Texas. So after the suit, let's go to August. We get reports of two migrants being found dead in the Rio Grande near Eagle Pass. I think the argument here by the federal government would likely be deployment of the buoys and the razor wire prevented Texas officials from being able to, I'm sorry, prevented Border Patrol from being able to help and that these people drowned as a result of it. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, I know my personal views really aren't that important here, but it, it, it seems like these folks crossed the Rio Grande likely being able to see and know that there was razor wire and little help and it's rough water. And, and I feel like the dangerous condition that causes the death of some of these migrants is actually created by the fact that they had at least at one point, a reasonable expectation that they would be able to just kind of bounce into America and everything would be fine. Um, once it starts to become known that you should cross at a, another crossing, my hope is that the conditions would be a lot safer. I don't think we improve safety um, by allowing people to cross. It seems to me that there would be much more than two people dead if we continued to have these open borders and have people you know, running across the Rio Grande or climbing over 30-foot border walls um, or traveling 3,000 miles to try to get to the United States. That's probably a much higher cause of death than Texas deploying razor wire. But, you know, I, I, if, if I had a nickel for every time I've seen the federal government um, try to use an unfortunate incident to um, to make a stretch argument like that, um, I, I certainly would have a lot um, a lot less cases and a lot more free time on my hand because I'd be able to make my money elsewhere. So let's go to December 1st. We're starting to get into the cold weather here. And um, we're starting to get a little closer to all of this powder keg activity we're seeing in January. So December 1st, federal appeals court orders Abbott to remove the buoy barrier. Um, this is uh, the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit is, is right now becoming known as the circuit is the problem child. Um, I, I mean, uh, no disrespect to anybody on the Fifth Circuit, but this is just the reputation they're starting to get. Um, I've, I've been before the Fifth Circuit, had many cases before the Fifth Circuit, have current cases before the Fifth Circuit. And um, I, I found that when it comes to predicting their decisions, that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, we get a mixed bag from them. They tend to be quite law and order, um, but they also tend to um, back a limited government um, idea. And uh, they will largely push back uh, and provide a lot of the case law that the Supreme Court can use uh, should it want to decide on uh, limited government issues in a way that the conservative justices would like. So um, this case originates out of the Fifth Circuit because the Fifth Circuit is the circuit that controls Texas. Um, the Fifth Circuit actually sits in New Orleans. They have other places, I believe they can sit, but New Orleans is where the, the main arguments would occur. And um, they uh, they actually ordered Abbott to remove the barrier. Um, they said, hey, you got to get rid of it um, because I don't think that they could find a legal justification. The reason why I gave you all that background on the Fifth Circuit is if there's going to be a circuit that is going to be friendly to Abbott, it's the Fifth. And they weren't. Um, they told him he's got to remove it. So one judge dissented from that opinion and argued that removing the, the buoys won't dissolve any tensions that the Biden administration said have been ramping up between uh, the U.S. and Mexico government. Um, but I think that they really just couldn't find the legal justification uh, for the barriers and protecting the border. And I don't think that they want to author an opinion that states have the ability or a right to protect their border, because that would kind of immediately be cited by any of those other states who wanted to take actions on the border and uh, could create 
um, a bit of a mess. They need to they need to really stick close to what the law is. And and you know when that happens, when there isn't law to cover something like this for for a, a court to decide in the favor of of Abbott, then what you really need is Congress. Um, the law can change. Uh, you just can't ask the the federal courts to do it. Federal courts shouldn't be changing law. They should be interpreting law. It is their job to say what the law is, not what it should be. So then December 18th, and this was this was a law that I found incredibly interesting when I researched it. Abbott signs a law criminalizing illegal entry. Um, so kind of immediately after, I guess this was maybe three weeks after, um, but he gets shot down by the Fifth Circuit. He then says, OK, well, if I can't have the razor wire and protect the border, um, I'm just going to be able to wrap these people up and um, make it a crime and hold them in my jails um, if they they cross over. So he signed that bill. I mean, he's obviously got a pretty decent control over his legislature there, and that was able to happen um, pretty pretty quickly. Now, some people may say, well, how the heck do you have authority to do that? And when I researched this, when he first came out with the law, it's actually very clear. There is a federal law allowing state federal law enforcement to arrest and hold those suspected of unlawful entry. It is a federal offense, um, but state law enforcement can make an arrest on a federal offense if it's specifically allowed by the the federal statute. And in this case, it was specifically allowed. In fact, state law enforcement um, have uh, traditionally arrested undocumented folks uh, when they stop them. When they're suspected of committing a crime, they will arrest them and then transfer them pretty quickly to um, federal custody so that they can wait for potential deportation or prosecution. It happens all the time. And so what Abbott is essentially saying is, well, I'm also making it an independent state crime. That's a little bit of a stretch. Um, I'm not saying a legal stretch. It's just a little bit of an increase in the authority that was granted. Uh, now, not only did, did he have the power to arrest because the federal government allows him to, but he's saying that it is a crime so we could prosecute it in our courts. You could go to a jury or a judge with illegal entry and you could hold him. Now, as soon as I saw this, I said, well, you know, Abbott, great job. You've just now allowed yourself to create your own uh, detention facilities and you're going to be holding these people. What are you going to all give them all a, a jury trial before you deport them? Um, if, if you consider this a violation of the law, I mean, the constitution still requires due process. So if you're arresting people for unlawful entry and trying to jump out in front of the, um, the feds with this duty, do you have the infrastructure to support, uh, all of the things that you would need to do in order to prosecute and, and actually deport these folks, even if it was considered legal. And, um, you know, that that's not the case. He's not ready to do that. I was a little worried that maybe he was going to start building some internment camps or some like, you know, um, judicial centers where you could just sort of move people down the chow line of justice and then get them deported. But we haven't seen that yet, nor do I think we're going to see that happen. I think maybe he wants to use that in special cases. All right. So the big push happens January 11th, 2024. Texas takes control of the river adjacent to Shelby Park and Eagle Pass. Um, this really built the tensions up quite a bit. There's um, there's a uh, uh, a park, Shelby Park. That's where, from my understanding, I've never been down there, but from my understanding, that's where the Border Patrol would launch a lot of their boats into the Rio Grande and Abbott takes control over it. Uh, what he really did was choke off their main ability to be able to get boats on the Rio Grande, which um, then kind of got them out of the way. My understanding is that they were uh, using those boats to fish out migrants out of the water. And so uh, Abbott wasn't really preventing Border Patrol from protecting the border. What he ended up stopping them from doing is launching boats to be able to fish these people out of the river and then bring them back ashore um, into the United States. And so he boxed them out quite effectively uh, from that area. January 13th, just a couple of days later, two days later, um, there was a, a rep from Texas, a Democratic rep, uh, who alleged um, that two children drowned and that that was the, the fault of, of, of Greg Abbott. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know about that. I didn't see what happened there, but I, I think it's kind of difficult to say 
that um, that the actions of um, Abbott in in preventing the boats on the river specifically caused the death. I think these people got into the water. Um, it's a very unfortunate, sad incident. Um, but again, like I said earlier, uh, effective border patrol and um, permitting people to proceed legally at a specific crossing where they're, where it's safe is what we should be doing. And that seems to be what Greg Abbott is trying to do. And if people you know, can't conform to that, um, it's really difficult for me to say that it's the fault of a person who's trying to create a safer, a safer condition. So um, the solicitor general uh, picked up on that, uh, the, the two deaths issue, and they immediately filed it in a uh, brief with the Supreme Court um, that the tragic drownings occurred before the Border Patrol sought access to the area to respond to a different distress notification. Um, and I think the, the, the feds in their filing admit it's impossible to say what might have happened uh, with respect to that um, uh, that crossing and the, and, the, and the two people who passed away. Uh, but the Solicitor General also said if, if Border Patrol had been, um, had, had its former access in the area, including through the surveillance trucks and whatnot, uh, they would have been able to save these people. And so I think that they were trying to create a basis for emergency action before the court in their filing. January 22nd, this is the most recent news that I'm sure you've all heard. In a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court determined that um, the federal authorities can continue to remove razor wire at the border. OK, that's really it. That's the extent of the order. Abbott later went on Fox News and said, hey, listen, um, this doesn't really give us any clarity. It says the federal government can remove razor wire, but they didn't give us an opinion. They didn't give us a long written you know, basis for the opinion or explanations. They didn't help me define what my limits of responsibility are. Um, it really was a very short order. And the reason why it was is because this comes out of the the court's shadow docket, they often decide cases without a hearing. Um, they decide them based on injunction. I'll briefly explain how these sort of injunction issues go. Um, the I think the feds filed a petition in the Supreme Court. Um, or actually, I think it might be might have been Texas. Uh, and and that's where the border dispute got up to the Supreme Court from the Fifth Circuit. But the Fifth Circuit hadn't decided the main issue the main border issue. Um, these were just emergency orders that were getting passed to determine what people should do until the courts could decide the main issue. And so what was ultimately appealed was the Fifth Circuit's emergency order. And that went to the Supreme Court so that they could determine an emergency order. Now, typically what happens with an emergency request, an injunction request, or an emergency order is that the circuit justice, the justice who's, um, who is um, kind of presiding over that circuit um, can rule on emergency issues. So one justice could, but often they can flip it to the entire court. And, and that's what happened in this case. And so we have um, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Thomas dissenting all together. Um, it sounds like they wanted to allow the razor wire to be up there. And then the rest of the court in a 5-4 vote determined that the razor wire should come down. The question here is, is Abbott violating a law if the feds are removing razor wire while the states are continuing to put it back in place? That would be a crazy game to play out until all of this stuff gets briefed, but that's, uh, that's where we are. So then Abbott on the 24th releases this statement. The federal government has broken the compact between the United States and the states. That's where he starts. The executive branch of the United States has a constitutional duty to enforce the federal laws protecting the states, including immigration laws, paraphrasing a bit. He claims Biden has refused to enforce those laws and has even violated them. He then says um, he violated his oath to execute immigration laws. Um, he instructed agencies to ignore federal statutes. And he said he was wasting taxpayer dollars. Um, he then claims that, as I said before, more than 6 million illegal immigrants, he uses that phrase, have crossed our southern border in just three years. And he said that's more than the population of 33 different states in the United States. 
He then goes on to say, he cites James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, which is kind of extra for a letter like this, but I think he was writing it more for people to read like I am right now, as opposed to Biden. He says, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and other visionaries who wrote the U.S. Constitution foresaw that states should not be left to the mercy of a lawless president who does nothing to stop external threats like cartels smuggling millions of illegal immigrants across the border. I think the cartels are smuggling drugs, not necessarily immigrants. The immigrants are kind of a byproduct of that whole operation. Um, And he said, that's why the framers included both Article 4, Section 4, which promises that the federal government shall protect each state against invasion. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which acknowledges the state's sovereign interest in protecting their borders. Then he also cites a Supreme Court case, Arizona versus United States, 567 U.S. 387. He cites that case, which Scalia ironically dissented in it. Um, for the proposition that the states have a sovereign interest in protecting their border. And what he says is, the Biden's administration in failing to fulfill Article 4, Section 4, has triggered Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which reserves to the state the right of self-defense. We see this also under the Geneva Convention. Um, Different countries have a right of self-defense under the Geneva Convention. States have a right of self-defense. And then he said, um, Greg Abbott has declared that the immigration issue is an invasion. And he's going to invoke the Texas constitutional authority to defend and protect itself. And he's using the Texas National Guard as the force who has the ability to do it. Which brings us to the question of, can a governor use the National Guard for um, a purpose like this. Uh, A couple of issues that come up here from the legal side. The first one is the federal government has the ability to federalize the National Guard under certain exceptions. The National Guard technically belongs to the state. It's stood up by the state. It's funded a lot by the federal government, but the states also have a role in that. Um, and when National Guard folks get, get federalized, they have a specific mission that they have to engage in, and then they become under the command and control of the federal government. So if Abbott, first, can Abbott use the National Guard for border protection? I believe the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Um, we don't allow, there's a law called posse comitatus, we don't allow the military to be used um, in the interior of the United States for a law enforcement function. Uh, we don't want the military to be interacting with the population in that way. The military is to protect us against foreign invasion. It's also to deal with wars in different countries for whatever reason, to protect our allies, whatever it might be. But we are not allowed to send the Marine Corps in to occupy Rhode Island if they are doing something that we don't like. The National Guard really isn't much different. There are different laws that cover those different entities, but the laws in essence are very similar. So um, can the National Guard then appear on a border and engage in a border type function? Well, there has been some case law to suggest that um, National Guard and other entities can engage in certain checkpoints and stops. Um, That's been challenged before. And if they are simply doing work along the border, putting up razor wire, it doesn't seem like that would be a violation. Um, But the pushing back of the migrants is the one thing, and we talked about this a bit earlier, but it's the one thing that might have pushed that use a little bit too far and slightly over the edge of what they may be permitted to do. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the authority to use the National Guard. Um, And I'm not talking about uh, to use the National Guard to push migrants back, which is the one thing that we will hone in on. But let's just talk generally about how it's been how it's been used. Um, If you start to hear people suggest that it was, you know, bizarre for Greg Abbott to deploy the National Guard, uh, we, we have to reject that. Both administrations 
have historically used the National Guard down on the southern border to engage in certain operations. The question is, what are their limits? So um, even on May 2nd, 2023, the Biden administration sent 1,500 active duty members down to uh, meet with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents um, to assist with the influx of um, of migrants. Um there were already Texas National Guard troops deployed there under Operation Lone Star at that time. So so Biden has even sent National Guard troops and other folks from the military down there while this was going on, and he, he has used them for that mission. Um, the difference is they were given a limitation. Um, when Troops were sent down there in May of 2023. The Department of Defense said that the troops would provide ground-based detection and monitoring data entry and warehouse support and will not directly participate in law enforcement functions. So Biden said they're not going to be pushing migrants back, which obviously is kind of the distinction in Abbott's use here. Um, this... Um, this ground sensor stuff that that or ground based detection uh, that I mentioned, there's actually a technology where you can put sensors in the ground to determine if there's human movement. It's it's quite good, and that may be a way of sort of laying down an invisible fence and having border patrol agents sit back so that they could be deployed more effectively in certain areas because they would know that people were on their way over there or they could track kind of the the flow. Um, the authority for National Guard members generally is is Title 32 status, and that's when National Guard members remained under control of the governors of their home states and are not considered to be performing um, active duty services. Uh, but then when the feds want to mobilize them, they come under Title 10. Um, and that would be, you know, deployed to Afghanistan or something like that. But but Title 32 they still stay under control of the state. There's a bit of a distinction there in their different status. And there is also a distinction. I don't want to get too into the weeds, but there's a distinction on their specific mission and what they may be, be able to do there. I believe that these troops were under Title 32 status and not considered to be active duty service as part of the regular armed forces. So they weren't brought into the regular armed forces. They were still National Guard members for all intents and purposes. And so their mission um, really couldn't be um, modified to be more of a federal mission. They sort of had to stay uh, as a state mission. Um, you know, we've also got a bunch of other authority. Uh, Bush had sent people to the, the border, uh, George W. Bush. Operation Jumpstart, that happened. Trump has also sent a ton of National Guard members to the border. A uh, very common thing. Both administrations have engaged in it. And um, so with this um, status that the National Guard was given when Biden sent them down there, he specifically kept back the ability to protect the border or to engage in a law enforcement mission. That was, I think, the distinction in Biden's use. And their limitations would be sharing information, loaning equipment and facilities, providing advice and training, maintaining equipment, supporting, um, pr probably installing some of those sensors. Uh, definitely surveillance isn't really going to be an issue. But none of their authorization included pushing migrants back while they were specifically um, on the border. So lots of buildup. Let's get to the fun part and talk about the Posse Comitatus Act. Now, Posse Comitatus doesn't apply to National Guard, but I'm going to explain why I'm talking about it in a moment. But it's probably the most important law that nobody knows about. Um, because it makes us much different than other, other, other countries that have kind of wild uses for their law enforcement. I mean, you could go to, you can go to some other countries like Venezuela and stuff, and you can see the law, the, um, the military and law enforcement have just really blended and it's really hard to tell the difference. You know, we kind of saw that with, um, 
uh, uh, Gaddafi was sort of doing the same thing. We've seen some other African countries where their, um, their law enforcement and their military, there really wasn't much of a distinction. And so you have this military force rolling around the country and people can wield it to, um, to do what they want to do. And it creates sort of a, another branch of government that needs to be listened to. Well, um, the military is always under the executive, but funded by the legislature. We have the National Defense Authorization Act, which provides funding, but the president, for the most part, can use the military how he sees fit um, through the Secretary of Defense. Well, the Posse Comitatus Act is a limitation, and it says, hey, Prez, you can't use um, this act to, I'm sorry, you can't use the military um, on civilian soil inside of the United States against um, civilians. You can't do it. And the reason for that is because we want the military to be used outside of the United States, and we want federal law enforcement with specific authorization, as well as state and local law enforcement, so that we can protect the delicate system that we have. We have states that have police power to look after their citizens. We have a federal government who's looking after the health and welfare of the country. My personal opinion, have a, a, a federal government who's trying to do everything and take a lot away from the states. Uh, wish they would give a little bit of it back. But right now we have a law enforcement system inside of the United States and we don't need the military being involved. The The original name came from, you know, sort of that phrase posse from uh, from from Western films. Um, you, you can't you can't create a posse inside the United States. Um, that's a bit different than um, you know, the, the second amendment and, and, and militias and, and whatnot, um, because, uh, this really just relates to, to law enforcement. So it was passed in 1878, um, at the end of the reconstruction and, um, with the return of white supremacists back, uh, to political power and in some Southern states and also in Congress. And I think just like many of these other laws, there was a concern that the military would be used to, intervene in the establishment of Jim Crow, um, or that the Confederacy may use military inside the United States. And I think everybody just kind of agreed at that point that we're not going to use, we're just going to agree, we're not using the military inside of the United States. Um, it's to be used outside of the United States. And it has been around for that long, relatively unchanged. It is really just one sentence. Whoever, except in cases under and under circumstances expressly authorized by the Constitution or Act of Congress, willfully uses any part of the Army or the Air Force as a posse comitatus or otherwise to execute the laws shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than two years or both. We only get two years for misusing this. We get um, a potential maximum of 20 years for wire fraud. Um, God forbid you... Uh, um, give somebody a prescription drug that doesn't have a label on it. You can do five years. Um, but if you use the military for a coup, two years, come on, Congress, get with it. Let's change that. Um, I think the, the at, like you add up all of the charges against Trump and, and look at the potential statutory maximum. It's like hundreds of years. So this is a little, this is a little crazy that you get two. Um, not all military are covered, as I indicated before. Um, it really refers only to the Army and Air Force, but there was a different statute that extended the same rule to the Navy and the Marine Corps. We kind of, you know, consider all of them to be considered posse comitatus. And the Coast Guard has um, expressed statutory authority. That's why being in the Coast Guard is so much fun. I wasn't in there, but worked with a lot of Coasties and they were awesome. But they get to have law enforcement functions, too. They can, like, get in their boats and race after drug dealers, and then they could, like, deploy and protect a harbor from, you know, potential bombing. Uh, members of the National Guard are rarely covered by the act because usually they report to their state governor, which means they are free to participate in law enforcement if doing so is consistent with state law. That's the important part, with state law. However, when guard personnel are federalized, they become part of the federal armed forces, which means that they're bound by the Posse Comitatus Act. The big reveal, right? Everybody's talking about Biden federalizing 
the National Guard. But what happens when he federalizes the National Guard? He can't use them for any traditional law enforcement functions. Abbott is playing a a bit of an interesting game here. He is using the National Guard and he's having them push people back on the border and do things that traditionally the federal government wouldn't be allowed to do at the border. But if you look at Posse Comitatus and you look at some of the other law that surrounds this area, he's still got control of the National Guard because they haven't been federalized. He has a police power and he has a little bit more liberal use of the National Guard. So the next question is, can Biden federalize the National Guard to stop him? And that is where the law starts to clash a bit. So Biden's ability to federalize the National Guard in this instance comes from the Insurrection Act. Ironically, the same thing that uh, folks have alleged that Donald Trump has essentially um, violated. And that act says that um, Congress has the power to provide for calling forth of a militia to suppress insurrections. And the act has given authority to the president in various forms since 1972, um, which technically gives that um, power to the president as well. Um, Here are the circumstances under which you would be allowed to do so. The first way that you could do it is at the request of the state. This is what happens when we have a named hurricane coming through. Um, Or uh, I think the National Guard was called in in 1992 for violent protests um, after police officers were acquitted of the um, killing of Rodney King. Um, you know, for those who are old enough to remember this, there was a fantastic sublime song uh, about that day. We saw riots. We then saw the OJ verdict. Um, it was a very, very tumultuous time down there in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, you can use it to enforce federal law. You can federalize Uh, the National Guard and send them into the states to enforce federal law. I think the best example of this is in 1987, President Reagan ordered the Department of Defense to provide military units to help suppress violence at a federal prison in Atlanta. Um, It wasn't a ton of folks, um, and the disturbance was over before the troops arrived, but President Reagan, you know, went went to the mat in order to uh, get that done and and order the Department of Defense to do it. Um, You can you can do it to protect civil rights as well. Uh, There's a provision that authorizes the president to use the military to suppress any insurrection, domestic violence. And we're not talking about your usual domestic violence. We're talking about violence inside the United States against its own people, unlawful combination um, or conspiracy. That is so vague. Um, Not quite sure what unlawful combination means. I would really have to look that up and see how it's been defined in the prior case law. But I'm imagining that's like an unlawful assembly. Um, And I think the conspiracy portion really should be related to conspiracy to do those things that were listed. Conspiracy to insurrect, conspiracy for domestic violence, conspiracy for unlawful combination. Um, And if, and this really is a case only if local law enforcement is unable to provide sufficient protection. Now, under those circumstances, there's no requirement that the state request help. Best example of this, Dwight Eisenhower sent elements of the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas, to federalize the entire state National Guard to enforce desegregation. That is the most prominent example. 101st Airborne deployed inside of the United States to open up schools and enforce desegregation. John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson invoked the same authority to enforce their desegregation orders in Mississippi and Alabama. So not impossible to use that, um, but there's there's really got to be a violation. I think the best justification here for Biden would be, um, I can send the military down there because Texas has flagrantly violated uh, a federal, you know, law and and a Supreme Court order. I, I think the flagrantly is a bit problematic because I think the Supreme Court really didn't provide much um, context surrounding it. 
And I think it really just authorizes the feds to remove razor wire. So I think he may have some difficulty. I think Biden's lawyers right now are probably looking at it, but he's going to have some difficulty arguing that this is an insurrection, domestic violence, unlawful combination or conspiracy because Abbott has maintained all along, and this is the cat and mouse game that's going on. Abbott has maintained all along that he's doing it to protect the border. He's not doing it to cede from the federal government. He's not doing it to um, enforce the law the way that he wants to. I, I'm not seeing specific violations of federal law. Uh, for the most part, I am seeing um, Abbott trying to enforce the federal law and you know, consistently warning um, Biden about what he's going to do. And this is where people start to use the phrase constitutional crisis. We've got two provisions of the Constitution which appear to clash. I will tell you in any criminal case I deal with, I have multiple provisions of the Constitution that are almost always clashing. Uh, we just have to make the right decision uh, based on the information that we have. So will Biden federalize the National Guard in this context? Um, my, my answer is no. I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. There's, there's, a, there's two I think, things that we can think about here. The first is the political side. And I'm a lawyer, not a politician. But I think when we're trying to analyze um, the, the better arguments for something from a legal perspective, we need to understand the political motivations. The Texas National Guard um, rests in a state where there's a lot of pride for Texas. You can see that going down in Texas, and those people who listen to this from Texas will probably agree with me. Texas has great, great pride. All of the military members I've served with from Texas have pride in their home state, and they choose Texas over everything else, including the United States, right? I'm not trying to say these people don't love their country, but it's very much Texas first, especially when there's a different administration at the helm of the federal government. They tend to choose Texas first a bit more. So the idea that Biden is going to send, you know, people down to Texas to say, hey, National Guard generals and soldiers and all this stuff, you belong to the federal government now. That's a little silly because I don't think that would actually work. Um, I think that we need to get a grip on reality there if we think that anybody is going to move when the feds come down there. So I also think that if you're going to mobilize the 101st Airborne or the Rangers or you're going to send some Navy SEALs down there or whatever bearded guys with cool pants you can find you're going to send down there, probably about a third of them are from Texas. You really don't have much power when you're President Biden in this situation. You've got a microphone. You've got a podium. You've got an active campaign. You have a lot of progressives getting very mad at you for not doing enough. They're already mad at you about what's going on in Israel and in Gaza. Um, they're going to be more mad at you about what's going on in the border. And Biden is in a position where he just really has to try to please the largest number of people that he possibly can. And he's not going to be able to do that because Greg Abbott is being the squeaky wheel. Um, and... I think in this case, Abbott is likely going to get away from it, get away with it, because the political um, cost to Biden doing something in Texas right now is um, it's great. Uh, he's going to lose the state of Texas. It's going red during the election. Uh, Trump will probably be the front runner. It's going to go to Trump. Um, so what Biden really wants to do is ensure that he doesn't lose other states, but I think he has to bet on the fact that if you're progressive and you are, you know, really worried about the fact that Biden is closing the border, you're you're not the kind of progressive that's going to say, I don't like Biden, I'm going to vote for Trump. So they're going to vote for Biden no matter what. He is in a battle right now for the moderates. That's where it gets interesting. The moderates who might shift over to him are probably going to look to him to do something and handle this with some tact and skill. And Abbott is not going to let him. Abbott is going to say, I've been asking you for this for years. So Biden right now is pivoting and saying, well, you know, we've got this bill in the Senate. He's trying to say it's the Senate's fault. I think everybody sees through that, but that's his play right now to buy a little time. And I think he's probably going to stand up and say, we need to let the political process work out. Uh, I think most people will look at that and say, too little, too late. It didn't work very well. But I will tell you the last thing that he wants to do is look like a warmonger and cause a clash in Texas or end up trying to engage in some action 
that is going to spark um, more issues and make this thing go go crazy. There's a lot of people right now looking for Biden to try to do something, both sides. And I will tell you that if Biden does something like sending the military down there, it's probably not going to go uh, flawless. It is going to dominate the media cycles all the way up until the election. And it will probably look like a huge disaster, no matter how it shakes out. Biden can't win in that situation. So he's just got to negotiate. Let Abbott get away with a little bit um, and and negotiate. So then there's the legal side of things. Arguably, does he have legal support for the idea that he can call up the uh, military to send them down to Texas? Right now, no. Right now, absolutely not. I do not consider this to be an insurrection. I do not consider this to be any sort of rebellion. I don't consider this really to be any sort of unlawful assembly. I think the Supreme Court's ruling was very vague. Um, I think that if Texas National Guard were to start taking the razor wire cutters out of the hands of the Border Patrol, um, you know, we've got a little bit more of an issue because that's specifically interfering with with what the Supreme Court said they couldn't do. But um, until... A court hears the challenge to Abbott's law on arresting um, migrants uh, or until the Fifth Circuit and then maybe even the Supreme Supreme Court decides whether or not Abbott has some authority when the government fails to um, when the government fails to protect the border. I don't think that if I was in Biden's position, I would really want to do anything because I don't think I have a legal basis. You're going to have to get a little bit more flagrant with uh, Abbott's violation. You know, it was pretty clear in the desegregation cases. In the desegregation cases, they specifically said, no, we are not um, allowing African-Americans in our schools. We're not doing it. And then the 101st Airborne had to be called down. It was a standoff. Each time the military was activated for that, it was for the specific purpose of enforcing a specific mandate by the Supreme Court, not an emergency order, a specific mandate by the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, right? Pretty clear, long decision, very clear ruling by a majority of the court. Um, Here we have an emergency order. We're going to need more. I don't know if Biden will have enough time before the election, before November, Um, but you know, we've got cases being crammed up to the Supreme court level and they're going to be deciding some, some big stuff, but this, um, this border case needs to still get through the fifth circuit. They're going to drag their feet and then it'll get appealed to the Supreme court. And that's not going to be quick. Nothing happens quick there. I don't know that we will have a resolution. So I think we are in standoff territory unless somebody does something stupid. And I think that if Biden is going to progress with any action down there, he ought to wait for a very specific mandate from the Supreme Court saying that Abbott is prohibited from engaging in any Border Patrol activities, period. That's what he's going to need to see before he can move forward. I understand Abbott's frustration. I also understand Biden's frustration. Um, but I think that it's not that harmful to have Texas National Guard operating under Texas authority down there on the border. Like I told you, there are examples of every president and every administration doing it. If Biden is mad that these people are working for Greg Abbott and doing it Greg Abbott's way, that is kind of a minor violation. That's not something we should really be too concerned about. All right. We shouldn't be quibbling about where the razor wire is. Um, National Guard can be down there on the border just like they have been traditionally. Um, they're under the governor's power and they're not under Biden's power. And maybe that scares Biden a little bit. And maybe that scares his border patrol people a little bit, but it's not the type of thing we're really going to want to start making, um, civil war moves over. And I, I use that term only to describe what could happen if people start escalating out of control. Biden's Biden's smart enough to maneuver out of this, and Abbott is smart enough to maneuver um, through this. Um, Abbott has made this his his stand before the election. We'll probably see a few other states uh, doing something similar, and um, yeah, I'm really interested to see how it shakes out. But that's where the law is. Look at the desegregation cases. Look at the application of military force down there if you really want to see how it was applied. 
And, um, you know, I think you'll find that it takes a bit more for the president to want to um, take the military and apply them to the civilian population. And that's what Posse Comitatus tells us. That's why it is one of the most important laws that you don't know about. And I am really appreciative that you took some time out of your day to listen to DeNovo. I'm going to keep trying to provide interesting content that is really law focused and uh, not, not really politically charged so that you can digest these and look up the resources, these issues and look up the resources and make up your own mind about where this should fall. But look at Posse Comitatus and look at the actions and hopefully you have a little bit more insight than some other people about where these cases, um, what they really hinge on. Um, So we'll be looking out for the Fifth Circuit's final order. I'll hopefully update this episode or maybe later on down the podcast with that. We'll see if it gets appealed to the Supreme Court. And that will tell us a little bit more about the court's view of the use of National Guard under state authority to protect the border. Interested in finding out if this is going to change a little bit and Texas has some more authority, given that we have a conservative court, or if they are a little concerned about giving that right, because that means historically... um, You know, other more liberal governors would also have that right, and maybe they don't want to give it away. Um, Anyway, I'm DeNovo. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you all have a wonderful week.